All right, my name is Debbie Hamrick, and I'm the Director of Specialty Crops for the North Carolina Farm Bureau Federation, and it is truly an honor today to introduce our speaker. First, I'd like to, to thank our sponsors, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems Growing Together Project. That is a USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture grant, and they are working to help farmers in North Carolina position foods in the mainstream markets with a bunch of partners um, like the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, Farm Bureau, and others across the state. Other sponsors of today's session are the North Carolina State Horticultural Science Department and North Carolina State and NCA&T Cooperative Extension Program. It's truly an honor for me to introduce let me go through the agenda first, and then I'll introduce them. I'm going to give you an, introduce, a, an introduction to Brian Chatham. Brian is going to speak, and then he's going to be answering questions. Um, we're going to end promptly at 12.45, as we said, so that folks can get off and go do other things as they would like to. And um, he's going to address as many questions as he can in the 15 minutes between 12.45 and 1.00. If there are additional questions, we will be posting those questions and the, their answers on a Google Doc that we'll send a link to um, following the end of the session. So let's go ahead and begin. Brian Chatham is with High Mountain Farms in Jefferson, North Carolina. And I met him at a soil and water districts meeting <coughs> for District 2 in Forsyth County last fall when I spoke to that group. And Brian came up to me and said, yeah, I'm really interested in local foods and I'm doing some pretty interesting things. And he really jazzed me by talking about producing grains for local markets up in Ashe County. And the more we talked, the more excited I became because Brian is single-handedly creating a market for grain that's produced locally inside of the high country. And that's no easy, that's no easy feat to accomplish. Brian works full time for the soil and water districts, and he's farming on the side. So I'm with further, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Brian begin his seminar. It's really exciting, and I hope you enjoy it. So Brian, thank you, Debbie. Um, <clears throat> like Debbie said, I'm a uh, full time work full time job, farm full time. Uh, name of my farm is High Mountain Farms. Uh, the reason we call it that is um, we're around 3,300 feet elevation, give or take, um, and uh, we're located primarily uh, in between Glendale Springs and Jefferson, North Carolina. Um, we'll roll into the uh, presentation here. Uh, any, at any point in time, if you have questions, feel free to type them uh, over here on the side, and uh, we'll get we'll get going with this. Um, High Mountain Farms. I began small. Um, I have a background in wildlife biology. Um, for several years, uh, I worked in the private wildlife and the uh, um, public wildlife sector, uh, planting food plots, which was simply farming for wildlife. And uh, as many of y'all may know, uh, many of the crops that we use for food and fiber are also beneficial for wildlife. Uh, subsequently, in the drought years 2006, 2007, 2008, uh, changed my life forever. Um, we were growing corn, uh, alfalfa, soybeans, and leaving it standing throughout the year for the deer, turkeys, quail, and everything. And um, we got started. Uh, a local farmer asked me to buy some of my corn for silage because there, nobody had hay, but through cropping practices, I had beautiful corn. So second-handedly bought a, a, a cheap silage chopper and then have expanded from there. How did I expand? Um, first of all, I, I came into it, and i tell you, the first crop I raised was around four acres. Um, and that was corn. I uh, branched out into many different things. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. I had to realize that low-hanging fruit doesn't always exist. That beautiful flat field that you drive by every day to go to the park or go wherever can't always be leased. Um, I had to use networking, um, you know, use my family name, use people that my family knew, and sometimes it was 10, 12, 13 phone calls to get to the landowner. I also used a lot of GIS, 
um, and um, uh, tax maps. Also worked with some of the local ag offices and some of the local ag agents and NRCS agents. Um, I worked with a forest consultant on some things because most people who have forest land also have cropland. Um, we're seeing a trend here in North Carolina of um, just generation gap where a lot of older farmers are moving on. And um, so they're, you're able to bridge that gap right there. Um, and then after three or four years of working and working with people and them seeing how I farmed, I've actually, um, I'm starting to have to turn down land or to put, or put land on the back burner that I don't need at this point, um, which two years ago was a struggle to even find land, and now people are finding that I'm viable and, and doing what I uh doing what I say I'll do. And I also have to hire labor. I realize I'm only one person and I've got a couple guys, a high school guys and uh, Hispanic labor and uh, uh, things like that. It's helped me through this. Um, here's one of our cultural practices and you'll, talk, you'll see in my, uh, in my presentation that we're primarily uh, no-till, but oftentimes we have to, uh, we have to use uh, soil implements to smooth up things. This is where, this is on an old Christmas tree farm that had bald and burlap. Uh, and if anybody's ever been around a nursery knows that those, those nursery, those ball, uh, bald and burlap holes are a nightmare. Um, my current state of operation, um, like I said, we're in the mountains. Um, I farm anywhere from 2% to 35% slopes. Um, what we have is uh, some of our crops is corn. Um, we grow conventional. We also grow non-GMO, which includes heritage and, he and heirloom varieties. And in 2015, we're uh, going to certify a minimum of 12 acres and possibly up to 20 acres of certified organic grain corn to be used in, um, a, large, in a large retail market. Grow soybeans, um, conventional and non-GMO, both food and uh, feed grade. Uh, previously, we grew a lot of uh, conventional beans for haylage. Um, we're getting into the grain side of those. Um, small grains. This is our, uh, where you you really branch out into your niche markets. Um, we grow some oats, uh, red fife wheat, turkey red wheat. Uh, Rins of bruzy rye, uh, barley, and buckwheat. And currently we're growing uh, 54 varieties of uh, pumpkins. We got everything from tiny miniature ones up to 300 pounds in every shape, fashion, and color. And you'll see some pictures of those uh, in a minute. 22 of those varieties are heirloom and or heritage. Um, like I said, I work a full-time job. My land rent, some people are going to fall over, but oftentimes I get land for free just to clean it up or to put fertilizer and lime on it. And I'm having to also pay up to $250 per acre for some land. And I've just as a side note, I have been turned down um, for $200 an acre. They, want, they, they wanted more money out of it. Um, my family owns around 12 acres. And I'm using about four of it that's not forest land um, to farm on. Um, here we are unloading grain, uh, just kind of how we do. Uh, this is lo unloading uh, grain into a truck to be sent down to a local feed mill. Uh, anytime my combine, uh, you'll see in just a minute, anytime that combine's not in the field working, I'm losing money. Um, here's some of our pumpkins, decorative and edible. and edible. On the pallet here, you're going to see uh, the stackers. Those are heirloom and, and heritage uh, varieties right there. Um, and just as a size reference, uh, the, the green and tan one in the center with the four stack or that's over a 100 pound uh, fairy tale pumpkin. Uh, here's a picture of our roadside market. Um, <clears throat> 
my uh, air, my mother's kitchen is certified USDA kitchen. Uh, we uh, we sell uh, our 54 varieties. Sell corn shocks. We also sell jams and jellies that come off my farm. Um, we and we use pumpkin to bake pumpkin breads, miniature pumpkin pie, uh, and uh, various baked goods. And we sell here. We open um, the week after. Uh, Labor Day, and we stay open till uh, either Halloween or the Saturday after Halloween, and uh, we usually sell just about all of those out. Current farming practices continued. I'm 99% no-till. Um, we use cover crops after harvest on just about all of our land. Uh, this is a new concept that a lot of people are using. 40, 40 to 50 percent of our standing corn gets cover crops. Um, a lot of people think you have to disc crop residue in. You do not have to disc it in. Uh, I don't care if you're in uh, Hampstead or in Highlands, North Carolina. You do not have to disc. Um, we use row cleaners for planting on all of our stuff, even our pumpkins. Uh, this year, on our pumpkins, we used zero herbicides. We planted a barley cover crop, rolled that, and we had no weed pressure, none. Um, our corn populations, which corn is our staple crop, um, we plant somewhere between 27,000 to 30. 5,900 seeds per acre, and it's depending on the ground and the fertility. Um, soybeans runs between 145 and 160,000 units per acre. Um, that too pretends on the ground. In 2015, um, we are going to toy with the idea of uh, going to uh, twin row corn and soybeans uh, to get the most out of our land. Here you see um, an organic red fife wheat being planted. Um, this is into a pumpkin field. Uh, the reason this organic red fife wheat is planted is um, A, for a cover crop, and B, for a cash crop. Uh, this red fife wheat will be distributed into a couple local bakeries um, this coming summer when it's harvested. Um, and this will be raised organically with no herbicides and no commercial fertilizer. Um, so that's just kind of how we do. We're no tilling right here. It'd been easy to disc all that pumpkin residue, all them vines and stuff in. However, uh, it's not a good cultural practice. 80% um, of our conventional and non-GMO corn and soybeans are a one-path herbicide program. Um, I'll give you an example of that in just a minute. Um, I can't emphasize enough that fertility is 200% in your soil. Soil health, soil health, and soil health. You have to use that. Um, we are seeing a, uh, a big movement in the soil health, and it's, uh, it's amazing at what you, can, what you can see and what you can do with good, healthy soil. Um, we plant cover crops for soil health. We have wildlife borders. Uh, and also, uh, we own and operate a small feed mill where we use on the farm grains to uh, distribute to local livestock producers. Uh, so we can house, we don't have to pay the shipping to get grain up the mountain. Um, we grow everything in house. Is there, is, is, that's what kind of what we're, our concept is. Um, this is big on our farm. Anybody that comes to my farm, one of the first things they notice is our borders. Um, I'm very proud of our wildlife borders and our pollinator borders. Uh, we uh, just recently became a, a part of the pollinator program of bee buffers. Um, we also utilize uh, NRCS and EQIP and CSP to uh, help with these buffers. Um, it also helps break up disease, airborne disease, soil-borne disease, and it, it makes you, I mean, 
a happy farm. Um, yeah, some wildlife are pests, and and I know that some insects pollinators can be pests to other things, but we use IPM and we we have real good success with it. And here on the right, you'll see uh, one of our uh, one of our uh, food plots. Uh, we utilize food plots for wildlife. Um, like I said, that was my that's how I got started. Um, that's my bread and butter. Uh, we we do a lot of food plots for wildlife. We leave st some standing grain for our wildlife and uh, uh, deer and turkeys. Uh, we even have, which is rarity, uh, we have had quail on my farm. Um, so, and we get a lot of migrating neotropical songbirds. So, uh, we have seen golden wing warbler on the farm, which many of y'all may know. There's a big initiative for that. But uh, just a big, big, big um, part of our farm is the pollinators and uh, these wildlife buffers. Here you'll see covers in a standing corn crop. This is kind of a new concept that we tried this year and we'll be going back to it. Um, this is a standing standing field. Um, actually had <coughs> I had one pass herbicide program. Um, rolled it, rolled the co a previous cover crop down, planted the corn, um, rolled and sprayed, excuse me, rolled and sprayed, then planted the corn. Uh, and then when the corn got, and I'll talk about it in a minute, when the corn got basically to the V7 stage, which is knee high uh, for most in aspects, we came in with a tri-blend of uh, white clover, uh, crimson red clover, and I'll cite clover, and broadcast this with a uh, spreader into this standing corn. And you see here, this is looking down, uh, looking down the rows. We have no weed pressure. We're getting all that free nitrogen. We have zero runoff, and we've got healthy standing plants. Um, that's a big part of one of our programs. Uh, fertility. Um, touch on fertility. How do we utilize fertility? Um, by initiation of cover crops specific to the following, specific to the next crop needs, uh, my chemical fertilized bill was cut by 40% in the first year on both conventional and non-GMO. So in other words, when I started initiating these cover crop mixes, I didn't have to put out nowhere near as much chemical fertilizer. Why? Because I had residual. I had the plants doing the work for me. Um, and I still raise awesome crops. Um, we use, uh, in our corn, we use a pop-up starter, um, fertilized just to give it a kick, and then usually the cover crops, and that, I mean, uh, the cover crops will feed it, and if sometimes, uh, if the crop needs anything extra, then we'll come in and put it. Um, after your crops get up, Soybeans, corn, whatever it is, pumpkins, scalp, scalp, scalp. I can't emphasize that enough. A lot, oftentimes, I see farmers just go and um, just go and plant a field and then leave it, and then they get a secondary. They don't get a good crop. Um, if I see a problem area, I got maps in my truck at all times. Uh, I'll either jot it down on a map or mentally map it, and then I assess it. Uh, if it's a fungal issue or if it's a disease issue or if it's a fertility issue, then I try to figure out what it is. I can't emphasize enough the next point, soil test. That is the key to smart farming practices, soil test. You have to soil test. You have to know what your crops need. We can't guess. Um, we don't know year to year what our soil's doing. Even if you're doing cover crops and you've got a grasp on it, and it, even if you're 200% organic, you still need the soil test. You've got to understand that what that plant needs may not necessarily be in that soil, and that will save you big bucks in the long run. Um, we also utilize a lot of animal waste. We don't have chicken houses up here. I have to pay trucking to get chickens, 
chicken manure, chicken litter, up the mountain. But in the end of the game, it's still cheaper and better for my soil than chemical fertilizer. We use, uh, if you can get chicken manure, this year we're going to use some beef manure uh, uh, from a feeding area. Uh, if you have hog or horse or whatever, if you've got it composted, use it. It is puts organic material back in and, and it, it, it's really good. Um, and then we also utilize precision ag practices. And what do I mean by precision ag practices? I don't put out fertilizer unless I need it. When I put out chemical fertilizer or even chicken litter, I try to do specific placement of that fertilizer. I, I, I'm not wasting, I'm not overlapping, I'm trying to get that fertilizer in that plant zone for its use this year. Okay, here's a case study. Um, this is a cornfield. Uh, real quick rundown on it. In spring, uh, May 6th, it was planted at 30,000 units per acre into a green field, which contained white clover, kale, and rape. It was a 109-day variety corn. Uh, at planting, we did a herbicide application. At V7 stage, we came in with a whirly bird spreader, put two pounds of Dutch white, two pounds of Alsaki, and four pounds of crimson red. Put that in over the top. Our, finest har our final harvest population was 27,850. Had 167 bushels per acre, and this is upland. This is not bottomland. I don't, I don't have any bottomland, so to speak. Um, we harvested October 29th at roughly 16.4 percent moisture. That had a, that had a 59.7 uh, pound test weight. Uh, post harvest, the day after we picked it, put a seven way blend of barley, crimson red clover, purple top turnip. Daikon radishes, kale, rape. Okay, so next year this is going back to corn on corn. And this is an update. February 1st, uh, if you, you can see in here, you can see the covers in here. If you roll back that corn chaff, um, we, uh, you roll back that corn chaff, and even when Debbie came out to my farm back in late December, you could see the, the barley uh, and some of the clover coming up. February 1st, we've had a mild winter. You can roll that back right now today and see um, turnips uh, and some of those brassicas. I, I'm not I'm not able to see what they are, but they're they're tiny, but they're growing, and th that's feeding that soil. Okay, um, so that's kind of what we've got going on with that. Here's our non-GMO corn. Um, this was this corn was sold. Um, to a uh, to a uh, meal, um, it had alpha toxin tests done on it. Zero alpha toxins. If you see in the top right hand corner, you can see the clover uh, in the ground underneath that non GMO corn. Uh, this was a uh, 83 day variety corn that produced unbelievable. I actually was uh, for this seed company. I actually was third place in the yield contest uh, with them. Um, and you can see what nice ears it has, uh, good standability. I mean, this is non-GMO corn, uh, and it, like I said, it was used as feed grade. Here's some of our non-GMO flint corn, uh, which will be made into cornmeal and grits. Uh, just, uh, just pictures of it, how nice it looks, and uh, just kind of, I know those, those. Ears are a little are smaller than what m most people are normally seeing, but uh, flint corn usually uh, doesn't have a great big ear. Uh, here's some of our yields. Um, this is our top yields and some of our averages. Conventional corn uh, across the board, 2013 and 2012, we had fields that hit 231 bushels per acre. Now I'm not saying the whole field or the whole 200 acres average that. That's just fields that had 231 bushels in it. Uh, you know, in our smaller, our average field size is seven acres. I don't know if you read the, 
the flyer, but we farm around 370 acres, and this this coming year we're going to have a little more. But, um, you know, 231 bushels an acre at, at our elevation is, is something that's phenomenal. We average about 145 bushels an acre. Our non-GMO corn, uh, this year we had the yield uh, third place yield contest, uh, which was, like I said, 83-day corn. I had 165 bushels per acre, and that's utilizing those cover crops and that soil health, that soil fertility. Um, and across the board, we averaged around 110 bushels per acre. Uh, we grow white non-GMO corn. Um, we uh, our best year just because of the white varieties are um, they're they're a little more difficult to grow. Uh, we averaged around 104. Or we actually got 140 bushels per acre in 2013 was our top yield, and then 100 bushels on the average. Our barley, we actually in growing season 2011-2012 for barley, we actually had 85 bushel barley up here, which is really good. Um, probably the average around that's around 50. Soybeans as grain and as forage, our top yield's been 65 bushels per acre uh, for. For those of y'all that are familiar, group maturity, that's a group maturity um, three, 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 five mean. Um, and that's both GMO and non-GMO soybeans. Our average is somewhere around 50 to 55. And then silage corn, which was our gateway crop. That was our gateway crop that we got into grain farming um, and what we really utilized our best yield was uh, 27 tons per acre, and that was in 2009. That's planted on 30-inch centers, um, so, and that's still using the cover crops and and post post harvest. Marketing, uh, by far one of the most difficult issues in niche market farming. Um, you have to use a lot of phone calls, uh, a lot of emails, a lot of face-to-face -face time, uh, and you need to know your facts before you go into it. Um, you got to um, hold yourself to standards. You need to know your pricing and how much you'll have available. Um, networking between two situations also, between two companies also works. Like this year, we're growing uh, won't be certified, but to be organically grown red five wheat that um, will be shared between two bakeries. One bakery didn't have enough, and it's an actual wouldn't wasn't able enough to produce uh, buy enough. But when they partnered with the bakery in Boone, then we also then we had a crop. Uh, I can say this: it is hard to put a half acre of grains or a half acre of pumpkins or winter squash out for one company. You need to make it profitable and that's why you have to do your legwork. Um, legwork, knocking on doors, don't be afraid to ask. The worst they can tell you is no. I've been told no before. Uh, I, there could, we could talk about situation scenarios all day. Um, the biggest, most important thing you can do is to keep a positive image. Whether it be marketing-wise, um, return emails, return phone calls, uh, provide good product. Um, there is no price on being professional with someone. Be professional. Uh, just for example, I, one of the things that I would often suggest is if you're approaching someone about buying your product, if you have whatever product, don't show up in dirty jeans and a, a, a dirty shirt and expect them to buy your product because it's, it's the image that you portray, portray even in the community. Um, if, you, if you're a good farmer, and you do good things, there will be uh, plenty of opportunity for you to expand. And it doesn't happen overnight. This will not happen overnight. Um, 
but it will happen if you keep at it. Where can I sell? Um, here you'll see a picture that uh, Debbie took. Um, in the area we're in, just like most of North Carolina, we have a lot of deer hunters and wildlife enthusiasts. One of my biggest quote unquote niche markets is the deer corn market. We sell 77 tons in 50 pound bags a year to deer hunters. Um, this is a picture in a local grocery or a local gas station that, that sells our corn. Um, and uh, we have plenty of places that buy it and we're expanding every year. Uh, those are 50 pound sacks are weighed and tied up and that's one of our biggest niche markets. Find the market you're going to approach and the the market or the product that you're having and, and attack that market. Um, like me, I am a grain farmer so I look at people who will buy my grain. Um, bakeries and mills and uh, local feed mills, local feed outlets, places like that. Um, here you see set your goals high but also set them attainable. Um, I often tell a story uh, that when I first started grain farming and Debbie's actually been out to the place, um, the local hangout, the local greasy spoon I call it, um, where all the locals, old time farmers, cattle guys, everything, they all hang out. They told me I was crazy for growing grain corn. Told me I could never get grain dry enough to harvest. They told me it was impossible. Um, here you'll see me with my John Deere 9500 side hill combine. This I didn't buy it new. I bought it used. I have all of my equipment was used but in good shape. Um, smart farming, per smart purchases pay off in the long run. How it, those all those old timers out there? They said you you can never get corn dry enough, but you know what? I knew I could, and I went above and beyond, and I proved them wrong. Philosophical um, stuff. One of the my main themes is to farm smarter, not harder. Um, if you remember back the the picture of me or the picture of the tractor and the the disc, that's a 22 foot disc. I don't use it often, but I use it. You know, I when I do use it, I want to do the best job possible. Yeah, I could have got by with a a nine foot disc, but I'm making less passes over the ground if I need it. Um, just like my planter, I got a six row planter. I could have got by with a four row planter, but at the end of the day, I need to I need to be as efficient as possible. Um, my big and another big thing I tell all the boys that work for me, I got high school boys and uh, you know older guys that work for me, and I always tell them, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, you put the you put the inputs in it, then you'll then you'll reap the benefits of the outputs. Um, and then one of the quotes that I really like, and I really like to see uh, utilized, is uh, you can read it there on the bottom. Um, sort of in your blood, you don't think about the long hours or the money. You do it because you love it. Farming's in my blood. I mean, there's times that um, my girlfriend can attest. I come home at 12:30, 1 o'clock in the morning. I left at five the morning before, or the morning before, to go to the gym to work out, then go work a full-time job, and then at 5:30 p.m. I'm on a tractor or a planter or, or in the combine, and I'm working long hours. But I do it because I love it, and I do it because it's something I'm passionate about. Where do I see myself in the future? Um, at some point, I see myself farming full time. Uh, that's my goal. Um, this is where I see myself going. Um, we we are trying to expand the acreage of small grains. Uh, we're expanding into food grade grains. Uh, the reason we're doing that is there's market premiums, um, high market premiums. 
Um, something that we've toyed with too is into the dry edible bean market uh, for large scale food grade markets. Uh, pinto beans, black beans, navy beans, kidney beans, the dry edibles. You harvest them with the combine, they go to a processing facility and that uh, and then we are currently expanding acreage slowly. We've reached the point where we have enough land with me working full time that we really need to utilize more of what we've got than to get another 200 acres. Um, it, one of the things that I can't express enough is storage, having storage, especially in grains, even if, even pumpkins. Being able to get pumpkins out of the field in a timely manner, is there's something to be said about that. Um, being able to store them out of the dry. Um, so for our grain, is smaller bins for various grains. If you're growing niche market organic red five wheat and you know you can only sell about 3,000 bushels, then you don't need to put up a 8,000 bushel bin um, because you'll never utilize it. Uh, what we plan on doing is getting several smaller bins, around 3,000 bushels, so we can put each grain into a different bin, so to speak, and be able to store it. And then logistics. Uh, we found out this year that hiring um, Trucking is becoming a difficult process, uh, so I think in the future we'll end up having a tractor trailer with a dump trailer. We can haul all of our grain. We can haul um, all of our soil amendments, uh, biosolids, gypsum, lime, uh, chicken litter, uh, cow manure, anything we'll be able to haul with that. Um, so that's kind of where we're, where we're going to in the future. Brian, yeah, we, we had a couple of questions come in when you were talking. Okay. Uh, can you read the one from Teresa Baker there on the screen? She asks, is there a best cover crop for a school slash community garden with moderate foot traffic? So, Teresa, uh, my question would be, at what point in time would your crop, your garden crop, come off, I'm assuming, in early fall? And to answer your question, um, Yes, there is. Um, I would say something with like, uh, and of course I would have to look at the soil profile, but just, just shooting from the hip here, you're going to want something like uh, rye grain, something that will fixate nitrogen, so like a rye grain and like two different types of um, clovers. Wouldn't hesitate a bit to throw some buckwheat and also a brassica in. So what you're do, what you're addressing with your buckwheat is you're getting phosphorus. Buckwheat has an, uh, a little uh chemical in it that brings phosphorus to the soil as it breaks uh, to the surface as it breaks down up to 80 pounds per acre. If you've got good clover that's been inoculated, you, you know, you can pull a lot of nitrogen back up from that. So if you've got a couple annual clovers in there, like crimson red and all psych or even Dutch white clover, uh, they're going to tolerate, it'll tolerate the foot traffic, the moderate foot traffic, specifically the rye grain too. Um, the rye grain will tolerate it. Um, oftentimes rye grain is planted as a cover crop and then when it reaches the boot stage it's grazed. Uh, so it can talk and then harvest it as a grain later. So it can tolerate foot traffic too. Uh, Brian, we have we have a second question from Edgar Miller. Um, he asks, would your operation benefit from having additional processing facilities? I know one of the things you mentioned in your future is additional storage facilities. So if you wouldn't mind addressing that whole um, opportunity for you to do more with what you have through processing and or storage. Processing uh, facilities, Edgar, would, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, storage and whatnot. Yes, that is definitely so. And that's why in one of my later later bullet points I, I put in that definitely you need storage specifically, even for pumpkins. I mean, that's one of the things that we have a whirlwind of pumpkins up here in the mountains and not a lot of guys have storage, uh, place dry, put them under dry roof, and 
So what happens is later in the year you get a substandard product. But if you're able to take pumpkins and get them in out of the rain uh, in, in the bins that they're transported in, then yes. Um, you know, one of the things, too, as far as processing facilities that we are actually looking at is a uh, is two different things. One's a uh, a feed a large a large feed mill, and the other thing is a commercial fertilized blender, um, where we can buy for our conventional crops bulk fertilize, you know, buy and then mix it ourselves as to what we need. So I guess Edgar, to answer your question, yes, it would benefit more. But that's one of those things you you can't outgrow your storage and and you need to be able to have storage and processing facilities on the farm. Thank you. So, Brian, when I was up there, we had a very interesting discussion about um, one of the larger markets that you're selling your grain into, and that is the animal feed market that's proximate to the high country. And you, you had mentioned you're going into um, to Virginia some. You've got some buyers in North Carolina. What do those markets look like? And what do you see for the future? So I'd ask you, how big do you think we could have local grain production for those markets in the North Carolina mountains? You know, Debbie, there's one thing about it. Um, I can remember a few years ago a guy talking to me and told me I should get out of grain corn and start growing sweet corn. And I said, why? And he said, well, people got to eat. And I said, yeah, but you can't always move sweet corn. And one of the good things, especially any commodity grain, there is always, always, always going to be a market for it, especially in the feed grade world. Um, here in the mountains and in the foothills, uh, we have a lot of chicken producers. Uh, we're getting to have a lot of hog producers. Um, there's a ton Within an hour's drive, well, excuse me, within 45 minutes drive of my home location, um, you've got in North Carolina three of the biggest beef cattle producing state or counties in the state. You go over to the edge of Virginia, you've got two of the top ones in the state of Virginia. Um, so there's room for expansion, and I think um, on the niche market. On the niche market side, uh, there's there's definitely room for expansion. One of the things that we're seeing um, is uh, local grain. I mean, local breweries. Um, there's there's market product. Uh, there's market potential there. Um, there's market potential for these bakeries. There's bakeries popping up on every corner. Um, there's some co-ops being developed. Uh, there's one in Asheville. You you have one in Greensboro, I think. There's a lot of co-ops being developed. So, in other words, the replication of what I'm doing is is vast. I mean, you, there it's 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 endless. Um, you know, I think with cattle prices and people are always going to eat beef and people are always going to eat hog or pork uh, and pe people have to feed chickens. So that 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 market is is virtually limitless. In my opinion, you know, and when I when I came to, came up to see you, I'm going to be very honest. I was really shocked that you own your own combine, because a lot of the food folks that I work with in local foods, they like to share equipment or rent equipment. So, what did that rationale look like for you to purchase that combine, and and how did you get started? Were, were you doing some? Did, did other folks harvest for you in the beginning? And what was that? What did that look like, and how did you determine you had enough acreage in order to justify making that purchase? So basically, the rundown on that is I did um, some basic economics. So we went. We we were primarily silage in the beginning, and and then um, we got into seeing that the grain market was there, and in in handling silage is is just. You know, it sometimes it becomes a nightmare, and, and and having to handle it two and three and four times to get it to the producer was becoming a, you know, tiresome. And the grain prices, I'm not going to lie, I mean, grain prices were up. So what I did is I, I knew how many acres I had, I knew how much I could expand. So what I looked at was, okay, 
what's my credit limability, and how can I utilize grain? Because I'll be honest with you, we were chopping for silage 200 bushel of acre corn and chopping it for silage. And, you know, we had truck drivers hauling silage to dairies down in Asheboro and um, down in Lincoln County and, and uh, over in the Yakin in Surrey County. And they go, and you're crazy for chopping this silage this good of corn. And um, so what I did is I, I kind of run a financial simulator and a break-even analysis and and seeing that at the current state of affairs we could expand enough to um, to get a combine. And um, I'll be honest with you, the first year it didn't happen. Um, and uh, I got to looking at some more things, and I, I had some more capital to put in at payment wise, uh, Debbie. And what I done is uh, I knew a level land combine would be out of sorts here. So I, I started looking at side hill combines, and anyway, I ended up calling a company in uh, in Pennsylvania and working through Pennsylvania Farm Credit, um, who gave me a line of credit which exceeded what I needed, and we put together a package, and um, and I purchased my combine, and um, it was the first combine that, to my knowledge, in my area. Um, there since a couple guys have gotten some smaller ones, but um, and that goes back to, yes, I could have got by with a smaller combine, with like a 6620 or a 4420, even a 7720. But it goes back to farming smarter, not harder. Because if I had a smaller combine, I'm going to be combining twice as long. So I bought the larger combine to be able to harvest efficiently the acres I had in the time frame that I had. Okay, so um, my next question is, you do work for soil and water um, in here in North Carolina, and so you're familiar with some of the National Resources Conservation Services programs at the national level and some of the programs here at the state level. Can you talk a little bit about, do, do you take advantage of some of those programs with your wildlife habitat and some of your farming practices? For example, I know that you are on steep slopes, so that prohibits some things for you. But talk talk a little bit about that for other folks from high country areas that might be on the on the webinar. And I and you know I can talk all across the state because I can say um, I worked with NRCS to get because a lot of our land is what's called HEL or highly erodible. Um, I don't want a sod bust. I don't need to stick a plow in HEL land. Um, what I would prefer to do is to utilize the land to the best of its abilities. So I worked with NRCS. Um, we came out, we flagged out waterways on some of our steeper areas that I did not plant, that we leave in grass. Um, we utilized the buffer areas, as you've seen on our farm, Debbie, and as some of those pictures told. Um, we also have signed up for the CSP program for the pollinator habitat. Um, on one farm uh, that I was able to lease, uh, literally had no access. The, the, the access road that was in there was rutted out three and four feet deep. And um, you just couldn't, there was no way to get an equipment in there. So I utilized uh, Equip um, and got Equip to cough share on a road. Uh, you know, and it ended up, you know, it's completely changed the farm. Before you couldn't get a pickup truck in it. Now I can get a tractor and trailer. It's, it's, you know, I've got 12 foot wide roads. Uh, I can get a tractor and trailer in and out to load grain. I can get a tractor and trailer in and out to bring me um, fertilizer, you know, to bring me manure, to bring me lime. Um, you know, and it's, uh, it, yes, I have utilized them. Um, as much as possible. So, um, you know, don't think it's a grant program because it's not. Those programs are not grant-based programs. They're cost share. And, um, you know, my my Equip Road, I paid, you know, it paid in the grand scheme of things real money-wise in modern day, it paid about 60% of the road. And I still had to pay 40% of it. So, 
you know, it's uh, it, there it, the programs are there, utilize them. But again, like I said, Debbie, they're not grants. So my next question has to do with time management and organizational skills. You mentioned you're at right around 370 acres, and your largest field size is seven acres. Oh my lord, that's a lot of that's a lot of complexity to manage. And you are using cover crops, and you're using a lot of habitat area, and you're you're working as hard as you can to minimize the amount of artificial inputs you put on the land. Do you have some kind of a software program or an Excel spreadsheet? that you're keeping track of all those plots and what, what happens on them from a year-to-year -year basis. What does that process look like? Well, it's funny that you say that. My, my girlfriend, she, she is, helps me with the farm and the farm management as far as, you know, thinking through things and putting stuff down on paper. And in my mind, I, you know, I have a name for every place. Um, you know, like, uh, for example, I, heal, I have fields three and four, fields five and six. Well, that's a lingo that we, we share on the farm. And then I have the, uh, the sister's field. And then I have uh, um, Frank Dillard Farm. And then I have Silver Creek. And I have Up Top. And I have the Raccoon. I mean, I've got field names for everything. So what we try to do is um, we, we keep a notebook. And I keep days I've planted and, and, and weather conditions and variety and whatever goes in there and then the inputs that goes into it. Um, we are, this year we, uh, we uh, are going to run a spreadsheet and do some farming software. I do run a, uh, a program um, on my smartphone um, to spray, um, keeps up with my spray records and um, so what I can do is I can pin a field, and I can um, I can come in and look at that field and say when I sprayed it, and and know what I sprayed into it, and uh, know the weather conditions and everything, and then I can print that out into a into a uh, a spreadsheet, so to speak. Um, well, time management, you know, it's one of those things that you have to. That's why I say farm smarter, not harder. You have to utilize your time. Um, it's hard when I harvest, and I, I think um, we we talked about this at, at the farm, young farm and ranchers. I mean, I'm there's two combines in my county. Do you understand what a circus it is when that combine's running? I mean, it's literally I could charge entry for people that wants their kids to take a ride on one, or they want to ride one. I mean, there's people that about wreck. They drive up and down the road ten and eleven times by fields just watch me harvest. So we've had to shut people off, and we've had to basically, you know, run interference uh, while people to keep people so I can harvest more efficiently, so I can plant more efficiently. Um, and you know, I'm thankful to have a couple of good workers that that I'm able to give a game plan, um, and that we run two, sometimes three tractors, where I can go. And be in this field, and I can have a worker or whoever be in another field and help me. Um, now, I, when I say that, I do all the planting and all the harvesting because that's the one of the that's two of the three critical pieces. Um, so, if anything goes wrong with the planting or harvest, I know I'm at fault. Fertilizing or or something other like that 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 can be fixed. But once that corn seed's in the ground, you can't come back a month later and when somebody screwed up or they planted it wrong, you've got to do that. So we utilize every ounce of time we have and window opportunity we have and, and you know, it's a it's a struggle. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's a struggle. You have to you have to uh pick your battles and you have to know that like we have farms that are further away. So I can't run back and forth 12, 15 miles down the road five or six times. When I pull into that farm, it's it's one slick. We're going to get everything done that needs to be done, and then we can move farms. So that's and 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 there's several there's several smartphone applications. There, there's there's uh, iPad applications that can help you manage that. 
and we when we utilize some of those. Um, I just want to. I see there's several more people on the uh, on on the web webinar, but uh, if you didn't get a question put in, feel free to email me. My email is on the bottom of the screen here. Um, and if you've got a question, think of one a day later or whatever. Want a farm tour? Want to talk to me? Shoot me an email. Uh, I'd love hey, you to know pop what, in Friday. Um, you know, some questions here that you could answer real quick. Where is your market for your beans, and how are they packaged and presented? Um, we like that's. I'm assuming you're talking about uh, soybeans. The dry edible bean market is the one we're going to tap tap into. We're trying to tap into those. Details are not ironed out. Uh, soybeans are usually sold uh, wholesale in bulk, um, and uh, you know we, there 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 is a opportunity for us to do them, you know, 50 pound packages. But usually, if people want them for feed, we run them in two ton totes, or they go out on a tractor trailer to a feed mill. Uh, second question: Have you had consistent success with broadcasting cover crop seed over corn? Yes, I, you, yes, I have over standing corn. Yes, it does work. Um, it's proven. Uh, Penn State, North Dakota State, Iowa State has all proven the fact that you can broadcast it into it. There's a little process that Mother Nature gives us called weathering, um, rain, uh, and which is mechanical weathering would actually help it. It, it rain seeds it, even rye. Um, even clover, uh, if you have open pore space in good healthy soil, which you should, um, it'll actually pull the seed underground and pull the seed where it has seed to soil contact. If it doesn't, the seed lays there. When you run through the combine and run and harvest it, the combine's going to give you great seed to soil contact. Those were the last two questions. Okay. Thanks so much, Brian, and thank you everyone for joining us and making our first Lunch and Learn webinar a success.